Hello and welcome back everyone. So in our previous lecture, we have learned the basic principles and characteristics that govern the design and the form of rest and rest seats. And today we will discuss the important design features and characteristics of the occlusal rest and rest seat. So as I've already stated, rest can be named according to the rest seat that is prepared to receive them. So occlusal rest is that type of the rest that is located on the occlusal surface of the posterior teeth. And the occlusal rest as well as the occlusal rest seat have a few design characteristics that are important for us to understand. So first let's talk about the design features of the occlusal rest seat. So when we view the rest seat from the occlusal surface, then the basic shape of the occlusal rest seat should resemble a rounded triangle. With the apex of the triangle being towards the occlusal surface of the tooth, while the base will be placed away from the occlusal surface, meaning towards the reduced marginal ridge. While the shape of the seat is triangular, the length and the width should be almost equal to one another. The base of this triangle should be at least 2.5 mm in width to accommodate the adequate bulk of the metallic rest. While the depth of the rest seat should be approximately 1.5 mm from the marginal ridge. This reduction is necessary in order to accommodate the sufficient bulk of the metallic rest, which will provide the adequate rigidity to the rest and the connecting minor connector. The surface of the seat itself should be concave or spoon shaped, meaning it should be smoothened out evenly and no sharp angles or edges should be present in the occlusal surface of the rest seat, which will otherwise create a definitive hindrance to the metallic rest. So when viewed from the side, the floor of the occlusal rest seat should be apical to the marginal ridge or in other words, the rest seat form should be made tapering and lowered from the marginal ridge. Just a little taper will be enough. The purpose of this taper is that when the rest comes and sits inside the rest seat, the angle formed between the rest and the connecting minor connector should be less than 90 degrees. Anything less than 90 degrees is acceptable, but this angulation is very important. Only by incorporating this feature in the design, the occlusal forces applied onto the abutment will be directed along its long axis, which is the main function of the rest to direct the occlusal forces along the long axis of the tooth. So when the angle between the rest and the connecting minor connector is less than 90 degrees, only then can the rest perform its function of axial loading effectively. And also this lowering of rest seat avoids the slippage of prosthesis away from the abutment, otherwise which may result in orthodontic forces being targeted onto the abutment itself. So hence lowering of the rest seat or making the floor of the rest seat taper in the apical direction from the marginal ridge is very important for the function of axial loading of the rest and also for the longevity of the abutment itself. But sometimes an existing rest seat preparation cannot be reduced further to make it tapering apically because there may be a high probability of perforating the enamel and going into the dentine. Because like I have said in my previous video, rest should always be located on the enamel so as to keep the tooth structure carious free and healthy. So if there is a fear that further reducing the marginal ridge may cause a breach in the enamel then a secondary occlusal rest can be used. Just like in this example, two occlusal rest seats, one mesio-occlusal and the other disto-occlusal are used. This will prevent unfavorable forces onto the abundment contributing to the longevity of the tooth. So often in Kennedy's class 2 modification 1 and in Kennedy's class 3, the most posterior tooth which is going to be used as an abundment is often a mesially tipped molar. In this situation, designing an occlusal rest which directs the occlusal forces along the long axis and also minimizes the movement of the abutment can be very difficult. In this situation, an extended occlusal rest can be used. This type of rest extends to more than one half of the total mesiodistal width of the tooth and also should be one third the thickness of the buccolingual width of the tooth. Meaning in length it should be one half of the tooth while in width it should be one third of the tooth. 
This will allow the rest to direct the forces more along the long axis and help to minimize the further tipping of the abutment. In severe situations where the abutment may be severely tilted, the occlusal rest may take the form of an onlay in order to restore the occlusal plane. So in this case, the occlusal rest will cover the entire crown and so it must also restore the occlusal anatomy of the crown. Another type of occlusal rest known as the interproximal rest may be used instead of the usual occlusal rests. These interproximal type of rests are usually indicated when the design of direct retainers or the clasp assembly require the use of interproximal rest in order to prevent the interproximal wedging by the denture. The joint design of these rests also helps in keeping the food away from the contact points, hence eliminating or minimizing the food traps in the interproximal spaces. The design of these rests is similar to the conventional occlusal rest, except that the rest must extend further lingually than the normal occlusal rest design. The more minute details of the design of the interproximal rest is beyond the scope of an undergraduate, therefore I have included only a brief discussion of the interproximal rests. So finally, we have another type of occlusal rest known as the internal occlusal rest. Now this topic of internal occlusal rest is also beyond the scope of an undergraduate level because it is a topic of interest for the postgraduate, but just a brief discussion can be given. A partial denture that is entirely tooth supported by means of cast retainers on all abutment teeth may use intracronal or otherwise known as the internal rest. These rests will provide occlusal support as well as horizontal stabilization to the denture. Therefore, these internal rests provide dual support vertically as well as horizontally. So the main advantage with this type of rest is to allow the elimination of visible clasp arm buckley because this type of rest is already providing the horizontal support. And it also allows the placement of rest seat in a more favorable position. So one key point regarding the joint between the occlusal rest and the abutment is that, that the joint between the two should be like that of a ball and socket joint in our body. This will avoid transferring of horizontal forces towards the abutment teeth because we need to remember that the only main function of occlusal rest is to provide the vertical support to the prosthesis while that against horizontal forces is provided by other components rather than the locking effect of the occlusal rest. If the occlusal rest also starts to provide primary stabilization against horizontal forces, then this may harm the abutment tooth by providing a leveraging effect onto the abutment and causing harmful forces to transfer onto the tooth which may lead to orthodontic type of movement. So in short, during occlusal loading, occlusal rest only needs to provide vertical support and no horizontal support to the denture. So this was just a brief lecture on the design characteristics of the occlusal rest and rest seats. So in my next video, I will be discussing about the design characteristics of incisal and the lingual rest and rest seats. So I hope everything is clear in this video. Please stay safe, take care of yourselves and your loved ones and goodbye.